Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Certainly want to welcome each of you all here today to our services at First Baptist Church. And we certainly want to recognize, especially those women in our lives, those mothers in our lives that have made such an impact on each of us over the years. We certainly appreciate all that you have done and all that you continue to do as you influence each and every one of us. So, happy Mother's Day to you ladies as well. We gather as brothers and sisters in Christ today, recognizing that we come here for one purpose. We set aside all things, dedicating this hour to worshiping our Lord and Savior. So as we gather this time, let us come as one and worship today.
show me in the call to worship was found in your worship. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. Sing praise to God. Sing praise. For Christ is alive and the Holy Spirit comes. God is ruler over all the earth and reigns over all nations. God of all nations over Christ's people. Christ is the head over all things for the church. Gather to know that to exalt in the one who grants revelation. We come together with us and God for all we have seen and heard. Please pray with me. Loving God, be with us in our worship that we might learn the sound of your voice, the warmth of your presence, the light of your love, and the sound of your calling. May we listen and learn of these things in the calm and quiet of this hour, so that we might know them in times of noise and hurriedness and confusion. Let us know that you are here, O oh God, so that we might recognize you when we meet you elsewhere. May we serve you by worshiping you, and worship you by serving you. In Jesus' name we pray. I invite you now to open your hymnals to hymn 349 as we lift up our voices and sing. To God be the glory. Please sing.
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, our scripture today is Acts 1, 1 to 14. And it should be up on the screen if you're in that. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did, taught from the beginning, until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this time when you will, be, will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or period that the Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and the Samaria, and the end of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifting up, and a cloud of him, uh, a cloud took him out of the sky. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olives, in which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James' son, Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot and Judah's son of James. All these were constantly devoted themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Children, come on down. Go to the um, when my mom would go 
work for that on Saturdays. Um, I would go for my mom. I saw the other one spend time with my mom. When you went to the driver, they would give you a lot of time. I'm always still doing that. But I would always get a get I would always get a uh, one to another time. So my mom, 54 years later, still brings me down a lot of time. Dead serious. Absolutely awesome. Yeah, now she's still bringing me out. That's awesome. What about your grandparents, your grandma? You know any great memories with your grandma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she loves she loves and cares. She loves and cares. You all can with your grandparents a lot, right? Yeah, is that, is that fun? Yes. Yeah. Well, what do you enjoy most about him? It's fun. It's fun being outside. Yeah. All right. Cool. You, your grandparents, what about yours? They bring you to church every Sunday. That is awesome. And so anyway, so all that being said, so there's a verse in the Bible, uh, what I'm sorry, but the one that I wanted to focus on today is one from Exodus, chapter 20, verse 12. It says, honor your mother and your father all the days of your life. And you go home from there. That's the part I want to share with you. That doesn't mean you have those who agree with them. It doesn't mean you're not going to get frustrated at times. But I share that with you because you probably give a lot more memories with your mom than you're saying right now, and that's okay. But throughout the day today, I want you at some point to talk to your mom and your grandma and share with them your favorite memory as they start coming to you. Okay? Because you don't know how long you're going to have. Okay? Mom, I'm 82 years old. She's coming over today, and I'm, I'm making that. Usually my wife makes it better, but she's on her way over from Cali, so I do what most men do. I'm placing more in marks. <laughs> but anyway, I'm looking forward to my mom coming over. We're going to have a good time. I'm going to share, we're going to share some memories. And we're just going to enjoy each other as much as we can. Um, and I encourage you to take time to thank your mom for who she is to you. And you all know what I do for a living. You know where I work. And right across the street, the children, a lot of the children I work with are simply not as fortunate as you are to have such a loving and caring mother. And that probably doesn't make any sense to you. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't make sense to them. It doesn't make sense to them. But remember that every day. That you are so blessed to have a mother that loves you. And don't you ever forget that. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for my Thank you for your love. Thank you for their love. For their nurturing. For their discipline. For their rules. And for always having. Help us to be good to them, not just today, not just tomorrow, but always. Amen. I invite you now as we stand and sing. And 682, you might not recognize the title of this hymn, but you'll definitely recognize this hymn. Please stand as we sing hymn 682. <laughs>
today is Mother's Day, and it is a holiday that was created by the car industry. Did you know that? So I always struggle with what to do on this day, because Mother's Day is not part of the Christian year. And I also struggle with this day because while for many people it is a day filled with joy and love and family, for others it can be a day that can be difficult. So for the last several years I have read what I'm going to read today again by Anne Young because I feel like it captures the mixed emotions that are held by so many this day. To those who gave birth this year to their first child or second or third or fourth child, we celebrate you. To those who have lost a child or a grandchild this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with hopes and pride and tears and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't need, we don't need to make this any harder on you than it already is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who have lost their mothers, we grieve with you. To those who have experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who have lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you long for it to be. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are step parents, we walk with you on those complex paths. To those who have envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet the dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who had empty nests, we grieve and rejoice with you. <laughs> to those who have placed children up for adoption, we commend you for your selfish, selfish, selflessness and we remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we appreciate and anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. Will you please pray with me? Holy and loving, mothering God, we thank you for mothers everywhere. We thank you for their love, their care, their concern, and their compassion. We lift up those who have struggled in their roles as mothers, where the path has not been smooth. And we pray for those whose mothers perhaps failed in some way. Bring hope in the midst of their lives, whether as mothers or as children. For those relationships that are strained, grant reconciliation. Where there is pain, bring the healing of your grace and mercy. For those unable to have their own children, fill their hearts with your amazing love. Bless the ministry, 
of the role to be a mother to everyone. And as we reflect, may our own hearts of love extend to all mothers everywhere. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his bowels gushed out. 
This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem. And so the field was called, in their language, Hakodama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his homestead become desolate, and let there be one, let there be no one to live in it. And let another take his possession of overseer. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all that time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who is also known as Justice, Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Will you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So in our sermon today is Who's Next? So last week, we talked about the game Twister. And we didn't have any takers on playing after church, unfortunately. So today, we're going to talk about the game Duck Duck Goose. <laughs> have any of you ever played that game, Duck Duck Goose? Yeah? Well, I, I read where in New Jersey and in New England, it, it's also called Quail Quail Quarry. <coughs> Well, it is a game that children, preschoolers, and school age children love to play. And on Friday nights, when we have children here, um, both our kids and children from across the street from Eagle some more, so that's a game that we love to play together. So the object of the game is to walk in a circle, tapping each person's head until one person is finally chosen. And then the chosen person is the goose. And they must chase the picker, which is it. So this is how you play. Everybody sits in a circle, facing inward, while another player, the it, walks around tapping, supposedly lightly, on the other player's heads. And then when they get to one, one child, they would say, goose. And then the goose would chase the it around the circle. Now if the it gets back to the position where the goose was in, is seated, and then the goose now becomes it. But if it's the other way around, they get tagged, and they have to go to the middle. And when we call we used to call that the mush pot. I don't know what they call it today. But that's where you have to sit. Now, when we play here at First Baptist, I always want to make sure that every kid has an opportunity to be it. So we always ask, who has a bit it? We have them raise their hands and we encourage the children to pick that one child. Well, it never works out that way. It can be a challenge for kids to pick kids who have been chosen. The adults have to continue to ask, well, who's next? Who's going to be it next? So, y'all want to go play? I'm <laughs> sure that 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 is. <laughs> so, how do we go about selecting who is it? How do we go about selecting who is next? Well, as you probably know, in the next few months, we will all go, go to the polls again and pick who's going to be our next political leaders. How do we go about selecting our leaders? In the political world, supposedly, we should be electing those who are most qualified. But clearly, our processes can be imperfect. Children may dream of becoming the president of the United States one day, but we all know that our system can be distorted by money and by political machinery that leaves much to be desired. Still, we participate, we vote, because we want to have a voice in the outcome. We want to have a voice in who is next. 
Churches also, we have systems for selecting our leaders. From nominating committees to congressional elections, church processes are designed to lift up those who are called to serve. Churches encourage people to prayerfully consider that they are being called to a particular task. Prayerfully considered and democratic, democratic, I'm sorry, prayerfully considered and through a process of election, those are hallmarks for many churches like ours to select our next leaders. But unfortunately at times, churches, including this one, have used arm twisting to get people to serve. Maybe some of you have your arms twisted in the past to have to serve. And that can be detrimental because the person whose arm is being twisted might feel resentment at having to serve. It reminds me of groups where I've been in where to figure out who's going to do a task, we play rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> Or have you ever played not it? <laughs> so that's where everybody puts their finger on their nose, and the last person who does that is has to do the task. We used to do that growing up. That was the person who didn't who did this last had to do the dishes. So what the disciples do today in our text to fill the spot left by Judas feels just as odd. It is leaving a lot to chance to choose who will be the next apostle, disciple of Jesus Christ. They cast lots to determine the replacement disciple. They could have easily flipped a coin or drawn straws, or they could have played duck, duck, goose, or they could have twisted arms, or they could have played rock, paper, scissors, or maybe they could have even played not in it. But here they choose to cast lots. Was the decision to choose a new disciple so trivial that they left it up to chance? Perhaps one day when I retire, you all could cast lots to see who your next pastor's going to be. Despite how odd all of this seems to us by using a game of chance, those early Jesus followers had every confidence that this simple process of casting lots was, in fact, a way to determine the will of God in that circumstance. Matthias was a follower who was selected to now be one of the twelve. And there's no evidence in Scripture to suggest that that choice was anything but right. But if you continue to read in the Bible, there's no other mention of Matthias anywhere else in the Bible. This is the only place where he is mentioned. All of this is very interesting, and one would think that after recounting this important moment in the ministry of the apostles, we would find Matthias again in the biblical record. He is, after all, called to be a witness of the other disciples to the resurrection of Jesus. Given the fact that he was chosen, we would think that he would be among one of the all-stars in the biblical call stories, alongside Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Esther, James, John, Andrew, and Peter. Instead, this uniquely called disciple fades into the shadows. But what I think is even more interesting is the fact that we know the runner-up, a man named Joseph, called for Shabbos, also known as Justice. He had three names. He is one of those characters in the narrative whose place in history is fixed, not merely because of what he did or did not do, but because of the fact that he is named. Like Matthias, we don't know anything about him except that he was part of the extended group of followers who were with Jesus at the time of his baptism. Well, how do you think Joseph felt being the runner of What's it been like for you if you are the runner up? I think about those people on TV shows like The Voice. Have you ever watched that? Where people make it 
through episode after episode, and then they're the runner-up. It never feels good to be the runner-up. Or maybe when you were a child and you were out on the ball field and teams were being chosen, and there were two remaining kids, each who wanted to play, and there was only a slot for one more kid. And when one is chosen to fill out that last team, the other child has to sit on the sidelines and watch. It feels pretty terrible, doesn't it? Well, perhaps that is how Joseph felt. Or perhaps Joseph found another way to bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is interesting to remember that we know as much about this Joseph, who was not selected, as we do about Matthias, the one who was chosen. Richard Lichner's book is entitled Open Secrets, A Spiritual Journey Through a Country Church. And he tells the story of his own life, where he was appointed to a small rural congregation in Illinois. And in his denomination, he was assigned to that church by the church authorities. And he, he did not care one bit of his assignment. He, after all, he had a PhD in theology. Surely he knew more than those farmers who made up that little church. He writes, Of course I knew that Christendom needed unstrategic little churches like this one, but I bitterly resented the bureaucrats who had misfiled my gifts, misjudged my obvious promise, and were about to place me in rural confinement. Well, in his first sermon, he thought he'd show those farmers a few things, and so he quoted James Joyce and Walker Percy. He talked about things those church members would have no clue what he was saying. <laughs> he was being an intellectual snob. Well, looking back on things, he knew that he failed to honor the ordinary, beloved people that were in the pews of his little church. He writes, Why couldn't I see the revelation of God in my little church? Why couldn't I see that those folks were constantly embodying the love of Christ in all they did? You see, in our little community, there was a little girl who had cerebral palsy. And people in the church learned to work with her, to pattern with her. And then they would help one another put up hay before the rains came. And then when one neighbor lost his farm to the, to the banks, they all grieved. And when the bank tried to auction off the tools and equipment, all the farmers refused to buy any of his tools. And then in April, every April, they would go out into the fields and they would bless the seeds as they were planting them. Weren't those all signs of church that were worthy to mention on a Sunday morning, he writes? Whatever lay closest to the souls of my congregation, I unfailingly omitted that from my sons. I didn't despise their practices and traditions. I simply didn't see them. So when he wrote this book 25 years later, he found out how many people he met along the way, many of them Joseph's holiday practices, many ordinary men and women who taught him the meaning of the communion of saints. On his last Sunday there, he looked out at his congregation and he saw Jesus there. He said, the only thing that made us different from any other kinship group or society was the mysterious presence of Jesus in our community. We were his body, which is not a metaphor. We really were his hands, his feet, and his heart. The ordinary world really is capable of hosting Jesus. As I searched the congregation on the last Sunday there, I really saw that it was true. Joseph called for Sabbaths, also known as justice, got the short end of the stick, literally. He wasn't chosen. 
But there is no indication that he lost faith in Jesus Christ. And if you keep reading the book of Acts, you see that there are hundreds of people who are unnamed that are Jesus followers who end up passing on the story of Jesus. They are witnesses. Most of them are even less well known than Joseph. Without the unnamed masses of people in Scripture, just ordinary people like you and me, without them, Peter and Paul would have been quite lonely and ineffective in their sharing of the gospel. We who are Jesus followers today are here because some ordinary person told us about Jesus. So while the selection method of who's next to take Jesus' spot as a disciple is really weird to us, and they left out Joseph in the meantime, that doesn't mean that Joseph was not important to the work of Jesus. Just because he was a runner-up doesn't mean that God would not still use him. My friends, the same is true for us. We don't have to be the winner. We don't have to be number one. We don't have to be the being chosen one. Because we all have a calling. We all have a task to do. We are all needed. We are all wanted. So who's next? Each and every one of us are chosen and selected. Each and every one of us is a child of God. Each and every one of us is important. Who's next to serve God in your unique way? You are. You are. You are. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of response this day is hymn number 653, Lord, you give the Great Commission. I invite you to stand and sing, and if anyone would like to make a decision this day, I'll be the next time. Hymn number 653. Let's sing together.
your we are humble. As children of God, we are also directed to reach out to those that are the unloved, to those that are up, do not know you. Today we bring gifts to the church that they may be used then to spread the word of God. To show the love that has been shown to us. May we then act and we all truly children of God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for just a moment. A few matters of common concern. Now, first of all, it is a joy to see extended families here with us today. Thank you all so much for coming and for raising up with your presence and for being here for Mother's Day, too. Oh, what a good special day it is. So thank you for being here. Next Sunday is Pentecost. So we will be celebrating the birthday of the church. So I encourage everybody next Sunday to wear their red, their yellow, their orange. So find something in your closet and red, orange, and yellow. So that will be a lot of fire that descended upon the congregation. So next Sunday is Pentecost. On June the 2nd, if you see in your worship guide, we have a church picnic coming up out at Rockland Park from 4 to 6. It's going to be a lot of fun. We had a great time out there last year. Uh, we're going, the church will provide the meat, and then if you could bring a cover dish to share, a side of dessert. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, bring your children, your grandchildren, your friends' children, your neighbor's children. Uh, bring yourself. It should be a lot of fun that day. It's a big part. Also, this past Sunday night, um, we had the privilege of having the ordination council. For Carlos Camacha and for Miriam Bruno, the pastors of the Spanish speaking church that meets here in our buildings. And we, the, the committee decided to pass on the, um, the, with their recommendation that First Baptist Church will remain dorm. So, so, what will happen is we need to have a church vote. We'll do that on June the 2nd. There will be a letter that will be sent out to each of your homes, or either with an email explaining that to you. So then if our church votes to ordain them, then on June 30th, we will have a donation service that evening. It's a Sunday at 5 o'clock here with reception afterwards. I don't know if you know this outside. Make sure you look at all the flower beds around. So Carlos and Miriam and their church, that was their gift to us. So they were... John Hensley worked up here for many hours yesterday, pulling all the weeds and putting all that mulch around. So make sure you look at it and give thanks to, to that church, Iglesia Baptista at Leto Pastor, for their hard work here. So we're so grateful for our partnership with them. Please make note of the other announcements in your worship guide about the youth event this next Sunday. Um, also, the Salvation Army is having their annual dinner here at First Baptist. There's information about how to support that. So please pay attention to all those announcements. A lot going on in the life of the church. Will you now please stand for the benediction? Beloved ones, whether you are a winner like Matthias or maybe a runner-up like Joseph, or whether you are one of the unnamed ones, know that God loves you. God knows your name, and God is calling you. So go now to live out that calling. Go with peace to love and to serve.